Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things you do in our lives, all the blessings, and uh, even the trials and difficulties that cause us to uh, cling to you. Uh, we pray for those searching for truth, and we pray for us in the study uh, that you can continue to lead and guide in our understanding of your word. Help us to see clearly what it is you want to say to us uh, as as a movement and as individuals. Help us to obey your voice and forgive us for our sins. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So, yesterday we were... We had quite, quite, I thought, a really good discussion. And um, I like the fact that, you know, Stephen always challenges things I say and asks questions because that causes us to look deeper into what it is that we are studying. So if we could, you know, su- sort of sum up from yesterday, because yesterday was supposed to be kind of this, uh, you know, just a review, you know, quick review didn't really turn into a quick one. But the idea that we see here is that there is this uh, intervention of God within these events. And there tends to be this uh, one is you see God's providence, but also you see um, how these events are connected to uh, the 70 weeks. Right. So that was the last thing that we had had looked at yesterday um, because we know with the 70 weeks, and I guess I should probably have gone there. Why is this doing here? So when we go to the 70 weeks, that's not let's get back here. There we go. Because we know the 70 weeks, the, the last two verses, they're going to be addressing uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the midst of the week, right? So you've got, 31 AD, the midst of the week, you know, April 27th, 31 AD. And then it's going to bring us up to the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. Um, the sanctuary specifically on August 6th, um, 70 AD, right? So you're going to have that, um, event. So when we're, we're dealing with, um, all of these. So we dealt with the idea that there is in chapter 10. Right. Just to go back here. Um, the thing was true. The time appointed was long. So the time appointed, uh, it's the word Moed, right? That refers to the annual feasts often are referred to as Moeds or sometimes gatherings or the sense of an appointed time, like an appointed feast. And it's going to be long or great, right? The thing is the Debar, right? So that's the thing, which is the word or the commandment. So, so Daniel at this point in Daniel chapter 10, which is the prophecy is in Daniel chapter 11. That's the same, same thing. Um, we have the Debar. So that's the thing. And it's true Emmet, right? So that's the Hebrew word for truth, Emmet, Emmet. And, um, uh, and then you have the time appointed. You could see that, uh, Oh, this one actually is not. There's another place where time appointed is Moed. This one is um, Saba, which um, usually is uh, um, referring to a war or a conflict, a campaign. So, so this would probably be referring to um, because there's another place where it says time appointed is the Moed. Um, so. This would be referring to the controversy between Christ and Satan, if we're going to be applying it in context. And so this is actually the great controversy. Uh, I should have remembered that before because I've actually looked at this before. But there's some other places where it says time appointed in his moment. But this one is basically um, uh, the, the, the matter, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was true. And there was a great controversy, right? If, if we could translate it that way, um, there's a great battle. And he understood the thing. So that's going to be the same thing here, the matter, the commandment, 
and had understanding of the vision, right? So the vision there is going to be the Moreh. And that's the, the vision of Daniel chapter nine, right? So Daniel has this understanding of the start of the 70 weeks and also um, the 70 weeks itself. And this great controversy, what's going on. So one of the things when we look at Daniel 10, verse 7, and remember, he saw a vision. Here, this vision is going to be the looking glass vision, right? So one of the things that we, we need to keep in mind is that in this vision itself, we have three different visions. We have the chazon of chapter 8, right? Um, and we have uh, and the chazon in chapter 8 is not uh, the 2300 days. It's the longer vision, the, the 2520. So it's referred to, we see that in Habakkuk ch- chapter 2, write the vision, make it plain upon tables. That's 677 to 1844. Right, the 2520. And then you have the vision of the evenings and the mornings. Right, so the visions of the evenings and mornings, that is uh, uh, the 2300 days. And when you look at in Daniel chapter 8, um, because it is, it's going to say here, um, so the vision here, he had seen the vision, the chazon, right? And and then he wants him to understand the Mara, the vision of the Mara. So the Mara is is um, oh, I think I'm getting mixed up. So the Mara, yeah, the Mara is the 2300 days, right? Not the the uh, Daniel chapter nine. Daniel chapter nine is the matter. The Mara is the 2300 days, and the Chazon is the 2520, right? Am I getting that right now? Is that correct? The Mara is the visions of the evenings and the mornings. I believe you're correct. Yeah, okay. So I, I was, somehow my brain was short-circuiting. And, and then you're going to have um, in verse 17. So Daniel 8, verse 17 is the reverse of July 18, right? Um, for the time of the end shall be the vision. And you can see that word time. That's that one, six, two, five, six. And, and then you have the time of the end, the Kets, and then you have uh, the vision here, the Kazon, right? So, so this is, so the time of the end, the Kazon that ends in uh, the time of the end, that's going to be the 2520 for Northern Israel, right? So there is really, um, in a sense, two Kazons, though they are part of a bigger structure. And, and it's going to talk about, um, these in other places dealing with uh, the 1260s and the indignations and so forth. So I uh, just wanted to find this other place here. Yeah, he's going to talk in verse 19. And behold, I will make thee know what shall be at the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. This one's going to be Moed, right? Time appointed. And so you got... Uh, a time of the end, you have a time appointed, you have a last end of the indignation. So the idea of this, this word of an end, right? So you got, uh, it's the latter end of something. So if you have the latter end of something, do you have a former end of something? You should. Right. So, so you have, um, the last end, because you have the first end, right? The, the idea in, in Hebrew, because uh, they'll talk about, you know, um, you know, at the end of the year, but they could mean the beginning of the year, or they could mean what we call the end. That is, there's ways in which they look at the ends of things, which is, is different than us. We just think the end is always the last end. But anyway, this is the last end, but that means there's a first end. So the indignation deals with the two 1260s. You have um, the daily and the abomination of desolation. So the last end of the indignation, that's going to be the one, the 1260. Now, that's one possibility. The other idea is that it could refer to the second 2520. 
right? So it could refer to uh, the 2520 for Judah. And and one of the, th- the reasons I would, and I've used to always argue this, because uh, at the time appointed, the end shall be, well, that's the Moed. And the Moed would be like the Day of Atonement. That would be a time appointed. And we don't have a time appointed, like a feast day marked in 1798. Though, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to refer to a feast day. But but so there are those options. I'm not sure which is the correct one. I've sort of dealt with the idea that it's the two 1260s. Um, and this is going to be marking 1798. Um, and, and based on other things in the context is why I would do that. So so when we look at 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 uh, chapter nine, then dealing with this destruction of the city and the sanctuary. And we take into the idea of this whole 70 week prophecy and the events that are going to. So we know that this is upon the city, upon the holy city. Right. Right. And upon the people. So. So obviously. 70 weeks are determined. Now, we know that the city itself is not destroyed at the end of the 70 weeks. Right. That's going to be the stoning of Stephen. And and that that's going to be delayed for 36 years. Now, why is it delayed for 36 years? Why why do the why is the city not destroyed at the end of the 70 weeks? Why is the city destroyed 36 years after the end of the 70 weeks? Well, Ellen White she says that the uh, the other the younger generation had to have an opportunity okay. to receive Christ. Okay, so that that's sort of a practical term, you know, a practical reason why. Um, but what about a prophetic reason? Well, you would have the 666 years for 36 years paralleling on either side. So one of the things we know is that the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is prophesied by Ezekiel. That is, he's predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 on the 10th day of the fifth month, right? That's what he's doing. And, and yet, because he's counting the years of Jehoiachin's captivity, which is going to be 36 years that he's actually held captive. But if we continue the count, the 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity is 70 AD. Right. So. So he is counting that and it's going to be on the 10th day of the fifth month in 70 AD. So. So he's. Obviously, he's not aware that he's doing that, but he is. So this 36 years attaches to that 36 years of Jehoiachin's captivity. So one of the things we have to keep in mind when we're we're studying these things, um, and and that we have noticed, is that most Seventh-day Adventists would just look at each of these prophecies as an individual thing. The 2300 days, sure, it's connected to the 70 weeks, but the 1260 isn't. You know, it's not connected to anything as far as they know. It's just you have the, the 1260 for, for papal Rome. But of course, there's the first 1260 in Daniel 12, verse 7. It goes from 723 BC to 538 AD. And there's all of these other structures. And, you know, in the structure of prophetic chronology or the, or the, the symbolic use of numbers, you know, I refer back to really the structure of prophetic chronology. That was what I was finding out back in, um, you know, my early years of studying this message, especially in 2014, as I started to put together the, the prophetic periods, is that that these are all connected, that they're not just separate. And we have this 1764 years from 34 AD to 1798 as seven times 252. 2016, Stephen said, what if we count back from 34 AD? And of course, we got to um, the year Jacob dies. That's the year in which Jacob is going to uh, bless his 12 sons, right? The sons of Israel. Um, and and so that becomes extremely significant. And then if you you know count how many years to 723 BC, it's going to be uh, 756, which is three times 
think it's 750, yeah, three times um, uh, 252, and then you have, wait up, they actually, I guess it's more than that. Anyway, we got these different uh, numbers of 252. I think it's uh, four times 252. It's going to be uh, 1,080 years plus, yeah, plus the 723. I'm trying to remember. Uh, let me see here. So you got, because um, you got 1731 minus 723. Yeah, so 1,008. That's right. So 1,008 years from the blessings of the 12 tribes, which is four times 252. And, and, and that was one of the uh, objections that uh, Uriah Smith uses regarding the two 20, the four 25 20s, right? The four seven times. He says, well, if there's four of them, then you would add them all together and you get 10,080 years, right? which is a really ridiculous kind of argument. It's not even a, a sensible argument at all, but that's where you get the 1,008. That's just one-tenth of 25, 20 times four, 10,080, one-tenth of that. That's, that's four 252s. And then from 723 BC to 34 AD is 756, which is three times 252. So you have this whole structure. And and so what we're looking at then, what we're understanding, you know, hopefully it, it's it's making sense to people that when we're looking at Daniel chapter eleven, it is really addressing all of these different time prophecies, and more more specifically, uh, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem in connection with um, this. Uh, um, so when, when we go here back to chapter 10, right? So, uh, so his understanding of the vision, the vision is going to be the vision of the evenings and the mornings, right? That's going to be the 2300 days. And, uh, the matter is going to be the 70 weeks. So Daniel has understanding of the 2300 days and he has understanding of the 70 weeks. And when he has that understanding, he's going to fast. It ends up being, 21 days, the end of the 21 days, he's visited by um, Gabriel and Christ, Michael, right? And then he's going to be given this outline of this history. And so the purpose of this history is what? Why are we given the purpose of this history in the whole context of this? Based on what we saw at the beginning of chapter 10. Because I, I don't think we've ever really address that you know most people just don't address it it's just this secular history but what is the purpose of it you guys have to answer somebody's got it so we got the matter the commandment to restore and build jerusalem connected with the 70 weeks we have the mara the, the 2300 days the evenings and mornings oh and that's the other thing is the visions of the evenings and mornings is, is true that was the other one i was going to look at so um, where is this? Um, well, it does provide more information. You have the idea there of the uh, anatomy skeleton, maybe Daniel 2, and then you yeah, have the respiratory and whatever. Yeah, so uh, chapter 11 is just like another sort of a transparency on top okay. of the right. what's been given. But it, it and it and it's but it's specifically addressing uh, this work uh, connected with these prophecies, right? So it's not just about this world history, right? That is, this world history only has significance because of these powers are going to be persecuting God's people, and they were going to be led to Rome, pagan Rome, which is going to crucify Christ. And then we're going to be led to papal Rome that is going to be persecuting God's people at the end of time in connection with uh, the Sunday law, right? The close of probation and all those different events, right? So we, we do often don't keep those things in view. So, so the vision 
of the evening and morning is true in Daniel 8.26. So that's, of course, uh, Erev Boker. Now, I always wondered, I mean, I understand why. But in Hebrew, it doesn't say uh, e- the evening and the morning. It just says evening, morning. It doesn't have the definite particle. It's just Erev, which is evening, and Boker, which is morning, without the definite article, which is kind of odd. You're not, not going to usually see them like that. And, and uh, which was told is true. Um, so that true, that's going to be that emeth again, right? And therefore shut thou up the vision, the chazon, for it shall be for many days, right? So the chazon is going to be sealed up, which is the whole of this, the 2300 days, the 70 weeks. These are all sealed up. Right. And remember, the first one that's unsealed by Miller is the 2520, right? The Chazon. That's where he, he gets that understanding. And in our history, the 2520 becomes this key that actually unlocks all of this uh, dealing with numbers and symbols and dates and so forth, which is why it's very hard to sort of backtrack and say, well, you know, we shouldn't have gone in that direction because that's where the 2520 leads. And, and if you go back, I mean, you have to, you have to continue to go back. You can't just backtrack to, uh, the 2520 and say, well, we, we still need to believe in the 2520, but that's it. Because the 2520 leads to where we went, where we ended up with July 18, 2020. Um, so, so if we could, if we could put this then, we have this being fleshed out, as Stephen says. It's 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 giving us more detail. But it's giving detail regarding this interaction with this prophecy of the 70 weeks and also the prophecy of the 2300 days, right? So when Michael stands up in 12 verse 1, I mean, that's closing probation on the Day of Atonement. Right. That that is the Day of Atonement began October 22nd, 1844, and it's going to end when Michael stands up. So Michael's going to stand up. He's going to um, uh, close probation. Then you have this time of trouble. Right. You're going to have the special resurrection, all those types of things. Right. And then and then he's going to go back and say that the book of Daniel is sealed until the time of the end. Um, and that time of the end is that other time of the end, same thing that we saw earlier. Um, many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be increased. And then he's going to have this vision, which is repeated in, in Revelation chapter 10 in, in a different form, but a parallel sort of vision. Um, and then they're going to ask how long, and then you're going to have this, how long is going to be, uh, to accomplish, uh, uh, the scattering of the power of the holy people, right? And that scattering of the power of the holy people is going to refer to paganism's scattering, not papalism's trampling. Yeah, it's going to be sealed till the time of the end. And of course, we know time symbolizes 360. We have these time of the ends mentioned. Um, so we have time of the end. So I, I want to look at this. So we know in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, you know, it says at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. Right. And so in chapter 12, when it talks about the time of the end, it has to be the same time of the end. That's what we understand. Right. The book is sealed up until the time of the end. And it's going to say that twice closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So that's why we know at the time of the end, 1798, when you have, um, the king of the south push at the king of the north, right? With the king of the north being the papacy. And then we have this other secondary time at the end where the king of the north comes against him like a whirlwind. So that's Daniel 11 verse 40b, we mark as 1989. Now, we have to be clear that it's 1989 is not really the time of the end in the bigger line, right? That is in Ellen White's line, she doesn't have 1989 as the time of the end. Do we agree with that? Yeah. She's marked 
So she marks 1798 as the time of the end. And so when we mark 1989 as the time of the end, we understand it is a repeat of history, that it is not the actual line, right? Because the actual line, um, sure, this event happens in Daniel 11, verse 40b, but it's not being marked at the time of the as the time of the end. Now, we mark it as the time of the end because we understand the repeat of Millerite history. And, and this, to me, is an important point when it comes to the whole issue regarding our lines and the time setting that occurs in our lines. That is, I've argued when we first started introducing time setting in 2018 is that our line was typical. It was not the actual line. And the only reason we could set dates is because we were in a typical line that was a repeat of Millerite history. And, and the thing about the dates that we didn't know and that I was uncertain about is could we actually predict events, right? So I knew we would have dates and we'd have time and events would happen. But the question was, could we predict an event? And we had many indications that we could not predict an event. And yet we continued to persist. And even after July 18, 2020, we have people still trying to predict events. But it's pretty clear with July 18, 2020, that we could not predict events. And so my argument at the time was we were correct as to the time, but wrong as to the event, just as they were in Millerite history. Now, that is, the time given us was the correct time. It's not like we needed to find some other time, because obviously the event will happen at a different time. But that event we can't predict. Just as the Millerites were predicting the second coming of Christ, but they predicted it October 22nd, 1844. So some people kept trying to find, well, we need to set another date. We just had the wrong date. But we know that they had the correct date, but the wrong event. And, and so that's what we needed to understand about our history. But now people, because the event didn't happen, gradually many people, some people immediately, but many people after a time, have decided July 18, 2020 was just an error because what we predicted did not occur. So people who were first supporting it, people like Daniel Fontenot, uh, many of the people in the American Canadian groups, uh, they were still supporting uh, the idea of July 18th. Now they have, I think, pretty much abandoned it, right? It was a sin that we need to repent of. And um, so... So hopefully this type of idea, what we're seeing here and understanding these lines in Daniel chapter 11 and the application that we are making to our time. So when we're making this, whether you want to call it a secondary application or just a present truth application, it's an application that is not the application of Daniel chapter 11. That is, when we're saying in Daniel chapter 11 that this is referring to Christ, that is, right? the one who takes the reproach upon himself. We're saying that's the correct way to understand it historically, why this is inserted in this time of Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar is seeking to become king, we have in this contrast Christ who humbles himself and takes the reproach upon himself, even though he has no reproach. Right. And then we have this contrast with Julius Caesar and he's going to, stumble and fall and not be found, right? He's going to be killed, um, murdered, 23 stab wounds. <clears throat> and then we're going to have the, the Caesar, Augustus, who's going to be the Caesar at the time. He's going to be really the, the, the emperor, right? Um, the first uh, emperor of Rome. Um, but he's going to be the one who's going to be the emperor when Christ is born, right? And it's going to be this taxing that's going to cause a Joseph and Mary to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem, right? And this is a type of census. So there, and, and there's a lot of, um, uh, this is actually a really interesting study. We've never done it, um, but to actually look at the history of the objections that people have to Caesar Augustus and his taxing and the birth of Christ and so forth. And they just um, uh, 
because there's some very interesting details that have to be worked out. Uh, you know, who the governor is and all these types of things. Um, and can't think of the guy's name, but you know, he's, these are all mentioned and, and, um, so sometimes people have these objections, but when you actually look at them, they don't, they don't hold any water. And it actually shows quite clearly we can pinpoint when Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem, when this tax was. Um, so they're going to mention, uh, this guy who stands up, right? So he's going to be Caesar Augustus. He's going to be Octavian or Octavius was his original name. And then his name gets changed to Gaius Julius Caesar, same as Julius Caesar. So we refer to him as Caesar Augustus. Um, and, and he's, he's going to die, right? So he's going to be destroyed. And in his estate, we're going to have a vile person and that's going to be Tiberius. And he's the one who's going to, um, be the emperor when Christ is crucified, the prince of the covenant. And, now, it talks about the arms of the flood shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And, and so we've looked at that briefly. Uh, but what, what is this arms of the flood that shall be overflown from before him? Historically, how do we understand that? Whether this is correct or not, right? Um, so he talks about Thomas Newton. This is uh, Uriah Smith quoting Thomas Newton. Uh, um, he wrote a book on uh, the prophecies. He's a relative of Isaac Newton, but he was a uh, bishop, Bristol or something like that. So when we look at this language, though, this uh, overflowing, they say it signifies a revolution and violence and fulfillment. Fulfillment, we should look for the arms of Tiberius, the overflower to be overflown, or in other words, for him to suffer a violent death. Um, now, is that the best way to understand this, this, this language of overflowing? Because what do we normally attach this to? The arms of the flood. So we normally attach it with the papacy? Well, well, we normally connect it to the Sunday law, but is, is that what you're sort of referring to? Yes. Okay. And, and, but where we first sort of see this is in Isaiah chapter eight, right? And, and the translators. Refers back to that verse. So this is going to be this prophecy dealing with Maher Shalal Hashbaz, right? And, um, you know, so this is the son of Isaiah. And they're going to write this on a roll, which is just a mirror, right? So it's written on a mirror with a man's pen. And uh, you're going to have Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Zebarachiah as uh, witnesses of this. And um, and so then he's going to have this son, Mahershal al-Hashbaz. And um, so this prophecy, it says, before he, had, he shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus, the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So Assyria is going to come in. And and then it says in verse six, for as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son, Pekka. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river strong and might many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up, overflow all the channels and go over all the banks. Right. So the idea here is this this overflowing, right? And he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over. So you got that same overflow, shataf, and then this word go over a bar, that is to cross over. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ye ear. All ye of far countries, gird yourselves, ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, ye shall be broken in pieces. Right, this doubling of that expression. Gird yourselves, ye shall be broken in pieces. Twice. Okay, so if we take this into account, and we go back 
to Daniel chapter 11, and we think about what the overflowing is, what what would they be overflowing? What 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 has what is this history? The arms of the flood shall be overflown from before him. Right. So that that word flood and overflown are based on the same word. Right. They just one Hebrew number apart. It's just one is flood is a noun. Overflown is an action. So what could it be referring to? Because uh, because the idea here in these you know Thomas Newton signifies a, re- a revolution in violence, and then you know it's going to happen to him. Is is that the best way to understand that, or is there some other way that we would understand this verse? Because we were looking at this as a parallel to the Sunday law in our history, especially since we have the crucifixion of Christ. So. Wouldn't this have something to do with what's happening with God's people? Well, the translators had looked at this and were using 1122 in combination with Daniel 1110. Mm-hmm. But then the latter part of the verse where they're referring, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Mm-hmm. They went right back to Daniel 8, 10, and 11, and then to Daniel 8, 25. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, because yeah, he's going to magnify himself to the prince of the host, right? Um, or prince of the covenant. But in, in 11, uh, Daniel 8, 11, right. right? He magnifies himself even to the prince of the host, and, and from him, uh, the daily that is the one who magnifies himself uh, shall be lifted up and exalted in the place of his sanctuary cast down, right? Referring right. to Rome. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so we know the prince of the host here is the prince of the covenant, right? Same, same person. Correct. Christ. It's referring to Christ. Okay. Um, so different word for prince, right? So, you know, that, thing that Stephen brought up about why is different words for prince used. Um, well, we can see that these definitely are both Christ and they're two different princes, two different words. So in this case, in right, this one was like a military commander in 1122. Uh, the other one in, uh, in here dealing with the prince of the host, um, this is going to be Sar, right? And then we have that other one that deals with the magistrate. So we have Basically, three different prince that are translated as prince in English. Um, but we still take them all as referring to Christ because of the context, right? Uh, historically. Does that make sense? I'm tracking it. Yeah. So, um, so going back to here, we got this, um, that, that reference and then 825, um, and that's going to be about the princes of princes, the prince of princes. Right. right. So that's going to be through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. So this is how uh, Rome is working. And he also shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Right. So we can see um, that this is, is going to connect us with Daniel chapter 11. So they're all connected, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, 11, and 12. They're going to be interacting with each other, giving us more detail from different perspectives. And we know, of course, that this is Rome, because in the latter time of their kingdom, in verse 23, when transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And that's basically just a paraphrase of uh, Deuteronomy uh, verse uh, 28, where it talks about this here. Uh, I shall bring the nation, verse 49, against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So that's the dark sentences. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. Right. So, So we have all these connections to Rome. 
is is sort of the point here. And and then what Rome is doing in in this context, we would have to say that this has to deal with the fact that it's in the time of Tiberius. Um, it would refer to the oppression that's actually happening uh, of the Jewish people at that time, which is going to lead to the crucifixion of Christ. So, so, but it's using this with the arms of a flood. Now, now this word arms, right? This is, um, that is the stretching out. So this is not referring to military arms, right? This is just the stretching out of animals, the foreleg, figured, you know, so figuratively it can refer to force. Uh, but primarily it's just referring to uh, the arms. And, and it's used often in the sense of military um, ideas, military strength, arms. And then we have this flood. So this is a deluge, right? So it's an overflowing. So you've got arms of a flood. Um, shall be overflown. And then it says from his face, right? So it says from before him. Uh, but literally, it's just from his face. So they shall be overflown um, from, now it says from before, but really it just means, literally it just be from. So this word 4480, mim, it just means um, from or out of, above, after, among. You know, so it's different ways in which it's translated based upon the context. And, and it actually means a part of, literally. But, but from out of, um, and then his face, right? So, panim, that's, uh, just the word face. So these arms of a flood, uh, they shall flow out from his face and shall be broken, right? So this word bro broken shabar is actually like to burst, right? So if we think about it, that this just is saying that that Christ, because of this persecution of Rome under Tiberius, this persecution of the Jews, it is going to lead to the crucifixion of Christ. So they're going to overflow. They're going to burst out in this act of crucifying Christ. So if we think back to Isaiah chapter eight, where we see this you know, coming up to the neck of these floodwaters, the waters of Assyria, and these, this battle between the northern and southern Israel, but Assyria comes in. So we can see here in this case, um, this the flood, this persecution, is going to end in, it's not, I mean, one of the results is going to be uh, the crucifixion of Christ. Does that make sense? Is that any comments on that? Because the idea that we have here regarding our present truth application of these verses, we haven't filled in some of this stuff we were talking about. Because the reason why we moved ahead is we kind of were stuck a little bit. So if we're going to look at this as Bush, Obama, and Trump, right? So you got Augustus being Obama, and, and it's, it is, they're going to be the razor of taxes. The question would be, how does that relate to this movement? How would Obama and what he's doing relate in any way to what this movement is doing? And, and we, we had trouble trying to figure out, well, how do we apply what happened to Augustus uh, to Obama? How do we apply all the details that talk about Tiberius? How do we apply them to Trump? Even, even with Bush II, how, do, how would we apply all of these verses to Bush II? You know, how does Bush the second stumble and fall and not be found if we're going to parallel that to Caesar's assassination? So we haven't been able to do that. And any thoughts on that? What we should do about it? Have we found enough that we can, um, make sense out of that? Any, any comment there? I haven't seen enough yet to be able to make full sense of this. Okay. Now, the one thing I, I wanted to note is, um, we have some events here that, that are marked, that are dated. So we have uh, the death of Julius Caesar, March 15th, 44 BC, right? 
Um, I mean, I haven't put in like the death of Tiberius Caesar or the death of Augustus Caesar. Um, but, uh, or even the death or even the dates. And we probably should do that, like the dates they began to reign and stuff like that. But um, we have the death of the crucifixion of Christ. And, and we looked with Julius Caesar as this contrast between Caesar and Christ. And the number of days between uh, the death of Julius Caesar and the crucifixion of Christ um, is going to be 2000 or 27,071. That's just a cardinal count. So I'll just show you this. So this is the number of days between um, the death of Julius Caesar and the death of Christ. Now, we see the factorization is kind of interesting. So um, we have the number 11, we have the number 23, and the number 107. So what would each of these numbers mean in the context of what we're studying here? So we're studying Daniel chapter 11. So we could see the 11 could refer to that. What about the 23 stab wounds of Julius Caesar? Would that relate to 23? There's 20 parallel. Yeah. And, and we know 107 represents the 10th day of the seventh month, the 187th day of the year on the Jewish calendar. So it, it, it's a symbol as well. Okay. So, so the 70th week, it's going to begin on the 10th day of the seventh month and on the 10th day of the seventh month doesn't directly relate to the crucifixion of Christ, uh, you know, as if we had like some other number that might, you know, 141 or something, 14th day of the first month. But it gives us this symbol that we recognize. Okay. So, so I think there is some significance that ties these two together. I haven't looked at everything. So just, that's just a, a quick look at uh, the number of days. Okay between these two dated events that we have on our in our study here. <clears throat> so we've we've connected these and, and I'm just going to make a footnote here. So I hope we can see that these things are connected based on on how we have uh, looked at this, that that we can see Caesar is connected to Christ. Now, the question still has to do. How do we fit in these presidents? Because this is this is something that's given to us from Jeff, right? So this was suggested. Now the whole thing back then, when Jeff was suggesting this, trying to think exactly when uh, this would have probably been in late 2016, early 2017, um, maybe. Um, I know he's going to be looking at other connections with uh, these emperors um, in connection. Well, wasn't that more in 2015, just prior to the 2016 election? No, nope. no, nope. okay. it's it's so in 2000 because uh, it's not until 2017, uh, you know that we're or, or December of 2016 we're going to understand Raffi and Paneum, and it's going to be late in 2015 that we're just going to understand. Uh, that the first verses of Daniel chapter 11 connect to the presidents, right? But this is later. So this is like in 2016, I believe, um, that he's going to start looking at this. I think it's right after, uh, or right at the end of the time, Steve and I, and I are, and Heidi are in Arkansas in 2016 at the School of the Prophets for three months. I think it's at the end of that that he starts looking at this. I know, I know he was dealing with these Caesars, whether he was connecting it exactly to these verses, I don't know, but it's in that history. So it's in 2016, um, just, just prior to the election, right? That, that's my, my understanding. Okay. So, so this, that's when we were given this. And so at the time I wasn't paying much attention to, it, so that's why I don't know exactly because I was caught up in studying Ezekiel and chronology and stuff like that. So I knew Jeff was talking about these things, but exactly the significance of it, I don't know. But the main reason had to do with the idea that Trump would become president. And, you know, he's this vile person, right? So he fits in with Tiberius Caesar. 
and that he's going to bring in the Sunday law. Now, so so this idea of the crucifixion of Christ in the Sunday law, well, this this would then happen under Trump, right? This this parallel to the Sunday law. So we would say it's not the actual Sunday law itself, because this is applying to our movement. This is a typical line. We can't know about the timing of the Sunday law. But in our history, we do have a type of a Sunday law that occurs under Trump. So we have the Sunday law with the pandemic, right? That is going to be a type of the Sunday law. So what would this crucifixion of Christ be in our history if we're going to attach this? So with this flood being overflown from before him, what would this be? If this is connected with the pandemic, what would, yea, also the Prince of the Covenant we're going to say that this parallels the crucifixion of Christ. What what event in our movement would this parallel? So who is Christ? What's that? Stephen? Uh, July 18th. Okay, so why July 18th? Why would we use that date? Well, we normally align the 22nd of October 1844 with, this, with the, uh, the Sunday law, and I think it has... Like a parallel with, uh, has been paralleled with the, the cross as well. Okay. Um, so we take October 22nd, 1844, and we parallel it with the cross. You're saying that's what you said? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if we say this is July 18, 2020, we can see in the number of days, right? So even that little footnote there that we have in the number of days, um, the 27,000 and 71 days where we have the, the divisors as being 11, 23. So we can see also 23 and re- relates to the 2300 days. Um, and we have that symbol of 11 relating just to Daniel chapter 11. So at least as far as I can see, then we would have uh, this um, 107 relating to the 10th day of the seventh month, ending the 2300 days. So we're going to just say that the cross is there on October 22nd, 1844. Now, exactly how is the cross there on October 22nd, 1844? Because it's the Sunday law? Is that it? Or is there some other reasons? Stephen, any other reason why we, we mark the, the cross on October 22nd, 1844? Well, October. 27, 1844 was preceded by the midnight cry, and the cross okay. was preceded by the triumphal entry. We shall okay. okay. the midnight right. cry. Yeah, so Ellen White parallels these two. Now, I was thinking more specifically, and why I asked you is, what about 318? So remember your connection back in 2018 with the the prophetic years with one day taken out. You counted. From the time that Christ is in the, the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to the mm-hmm. time he moved most holy. And you had that 318 days that was left over, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And you use that to symbolize the cross, the time that Christ is crucified. We put it in a, a symbol like a clock because it, it, it was, uh, because 318 uh, minutes was it, what was it? Three hundred and eighteen. No, I think it was Bob was fifteen thirty three. I think. Okay, fifteen thirty three. Okay, but how was it connected to the three eighteen? Because there was a three eighteen in there, so somehow we got that. Oh, that's what it is. So three hundred and eighteen. Somehow, how did that connect to fifteen thirty three? I'm I'm going to look it up. <laughs> well. So it's 318 days. So I think it's the, if you add, if you multiply 21 hours, 15 minutes and 33 seconds by 360. Or something, yeah. You, 315 uh, hours, but I think it's 318 days. Yeah. So it's 318 days. And so how did that relate to, I'm just trying to remember, I'm looking up an old email. So. Okay, so here's what I um, wrote as an, as an email to, to you and Jeff and Odilio and other people. So 
says, in the study of by Stephen Jameson, he counts the number of days from Pentecost in 31 AD to October 22nd, 1844. He arrives at a remainder of 318 days that amounts to 21, 21 hours. 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds. Ah, so that's if you take a year of a day for a year, right? So you use the prophetic day for a year, um, and uh, then you would, okay, now that makes sense. So that's how yeah. it worked. So that's. Yeah, well, yeah, I think you would multiply it by 359. Sorry, I think I said 360, yeah. but. Yeah, it's 318. Yeah. Uh, the next step is to divide 318 by 359 here. I can show you what I'm looking at here, right? So this is the email. So I go through this and uh, the minutes and seconds remind us of the crucifixion of Christ in Mark 1533 and the ninth hour at which he died, right? So if we take it as time, it's going to be 21, 21 hours, 15 minutes and 33 seconds, right? So that's the, the, long, the short answer. And then it comes to this diagram. So if we, if we were to put the, you got the, um, the hour and the minute hand make the, the cross piece, you know, the cross. Um, and then the, the stake itself is the second hand. And it would appear to be somebody looking up at the cross would see this sort of angle, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so this gives us the cross. Now, now we, now why did I bring that up? I'm trying to remember. Well, we're okay. trying to connect the cross to ah. 1844. Right. Yeah, so we're connecting this to 1844, to the Sunday law. Now, now if we're going to connect this to July 18, 2020, now, originally, we're, we're connecting this to October 22nd. And, and through that study, you also get November 9th, um, 1849, right? 1844 days after October 22nd, 1844. Yes. And, and the November 9th dates brings us to November 9th, 2019, which is part of this structure where July 18, 2020 becomes this symbol of the cross. And it becomes a symbol of the cross for this movement because of the disappointment. We, we weren't looking at it as a symbol of the cross prior to that because we were looking at December 25th, 2021 as the, the Sunday law. So if we're going to put July 18th there, what we're doing is we're connecting with Samuel Snow's letters as well, his last letter, which um, gives us the symbol of 187, which is the number of ordinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, which marks October 22nd, 1844. So it marks this typical nature of our line. So this Sunday law has to be a typical Sunday law. Okay. But then we have to try to say, well, how does Trump relate to this? Well, what we could say is, dealing with the pandemic has to do with these, these actions um, that are connected with that. And, and the time prophecies or the periods of time, I should say, that we have March 27th, right? We're going to have uh, that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to be, begin 100 days of prayer, right? 144,000 minutes, right? It's going to end on July 4th. Right, you're going to have 187 days uh, from July 4th to the 10 days of prayer, uh, beginning on July, uh, January 6, 2021. Right, there's all, all of these different connections. So, so when we talked about the pandemic as being a type of the Sunday law, it is a type, but it's a type that exists within our line and really has meaning only to us in that sense. So we should be able to see that what Trump did uh, here, we can understand in relation to what happened in, in our history, that it wouldn't be referring to a Sunday law in the future. So in the midst of all this stuff that's happening with the pandemic, we have in this movement, this crisis that occurs. It's not a direct result of, of that, but it is connected with it. Anything else? that we can we can see here that we can connect um this crucifixion of Christ. So we have these symbols. We have 
um, all of these different things that, that happened with um, Stephen's understanding regarding time that led to November 9th. Now, now what, what about Obama? Um, you know, because this is going to be, Augustus is the time in which Christ is going to be born, right? It's going to end up in Bethlehem because of this census connected with the taxes. So what role does Obama play as far as the history of this movement as a symbol, right? Not necessarily personally. So he's going to be a raiser of taxes. How does that, what does that relate to? I mean, we, we put Obama in there, you know, we have taxes with Obama, we have taxes with all kinds of presidents. Um, it had to do with the health insurance thing. Okay, well, so that's the main thing that Americans would look at is the dealing with this uh, the health insurance. Okay, but how how does this relate to what we're looking at in our lives? Can we find any connection? Okay, what does Jesus say about taxation? Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render unto God that which is God. Okay, so does that have any connection with this movement and the message? I would think yes. Okay, so where would we place this in our history? Could we place it at July 18th? No. Okay. Because we have the we have the crucifixion of Christ at July 18th, and this has to be in the time of Obama. Like we're we're still working with Obama, Trump, and and Bush the second. So in Bush the second, you're going to of course have you know 9/11. Um, so do we have some way mark? that we can connect with this symbol of taxes within the movement. You know, we have Obama there, you know, and I'm not necessarily certain that we need Obama there. I mean, you know, we have him there. I mean, there might be some other symbol that actually doesn't really have to do with the, with the presidents at all, right? But But we have him there. And so if we look at that time, the time of Obama is going to end, you know, when the time of Trump begins. So if, if we're going to look at an event in our movement, then we'd have to say, well, this has to go back to um, basically from 2000 and, you know, eight till 2016 sort of thing, right? Maybe early 2009 to early 2017, however we want to look at it. Is there some, some significant event that happens in this movement uh, that we could relate this to. That happens, you know, 9-11, we're going to have Bush. In the time of Augustus, that is Obama, what are we going to have that would mark, that be marked by these taxes? Anything. Because we have to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God's the things that are God's. Is there some some event that we could mark? There's nothing obvious coming out of my mind. Now, so I'm, I'm thinking about this razor of taxes. Just um, we have these Hebrew numbers, right? Uh, 5674 and 5065. Together, they're 10,739, which is 29 years and 147 days. I don't know if that fits anywhere. So I'd have to take a look at that. But as a symbol, it, it's it's... It's something that in this movement would be a call to make a choice between rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's the things, to God the things that are God's. Now, we say it's in the time of Obama, right? So that would put it in that period of time. So I don't know specifically uh, what we would do with that. So it's something we're going to have to, we're going to have to come back to. But if, if we're going to do this, we have to put it in, into the context of this movement and we have to have symbols that are attached to it that would, would allow us to place it there. So these symbols may be staring us in the face. We just don't recognize what they are. So that's, that's sort of our review, I guess, of, of addressing those points. Now, getting back to 23 and 24, like we've, we spent all this time dealing with the league. Now, we don't have specific dates for the Jewish League. Um, we do have some specific dates in this history uh, that are given in Maccabees. 
and, and I haven't looked at them all yet to see their connections. Um, but we know that this is going back, right? So it's going to go back and repeat some of this history. And so we haven't put any present truth applications in here. We've simply tried to understand uh, the original application. So in this, this, these two verses are going to go from 161 BC to 31 AD, right? So they're going to cover a period of 130 years. So any ideas of what these things would represent? What this Jewishly, we, 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 we said, well, this would bring us to 9-11. So we probably could put this in here, right? Because that's going to be, why do we parallel this Jewish league with 9-11? <clears throat> well, with the uh, spiritual formation. So spiritual formation that happens in September of 2001, Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, accepting the, from the evangelical churches in order to be our churches, our, our institutions of learning, our seminaries, uh, to be in compliance with their, um, uh, I can't think of the word. Um, anyway, in, in appliance with their um, accreditation, right? We have to, the ministers have to take a case, take a class on spiritual formation. And spiritual formation is basically just paganism. It's the worship of idols. And, I mean, it comes from, um, the, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius, right? So, but, but there is things where they have to actually like make an idol and worship it and things like that, pray to it. Um, somehow this is supposed to be helpful spiritually. I'm not really sure how that would be, but that's what happens with the church with our ministers, right? Okay, so there's a league made now with pagan Rome. So what would we parallel? We're going to just say, well, pagan Rome is paralleling this spiritual formation itself, right? The worship of idols. So even though it's spiritual formation, I guess, you know, of the Protestants, that he shall work deceitfully and... So they're going to use the League for furthering Roman interest into the Eastern religions. Well, we could see the parallel there would simply be uh, this connection between how the, I don't know how to word it, but basically the furthering the interests of Rome within Adventism. So we would say, I guess we should say papal Rome, just as it is within the Protestant churches. Okay, so for he shall come up, and she'll become strong with the small people. So we're going to say that that's the siege of Jerusalem by pagan Rome in with uh, Pompey in 63 BC. So do we have some date after 9-11 that we could mark there? Yeah, well, I think uh, with the small people, Darius Smith really gets out to the Jews. Uh, but then the swear engine, I think, is it swear engine? I think he makes an application of Different. Just Rome and its early stage. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that we're going to have to kind of decide upon. So we haven't figured out exactly how we're going to interpret that. Anyway, we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. So it's an interesting study. There's lots of things to think about, but uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, please be with us today. We ask for your care and protection. And uh, we thank you for all the things you do in our lives. And I pray that you can uh, be with each person studying truth, that your angels can watch over us, and that you can bring us back together again to study your word. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.